Good evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Is my American accent distracting? Yeah. Sorry. I could do a fake British one, but it'd be terrible. <laughs> really, really bad. Um, it's funny. I was sitting here with Vlad, kind of uh, waiting for the, uh, for, the, for the talk to, you know, for, for people to roll in and the talk to start. And I was trying to name all of the elements on the periodic table, and it was a colossal failure. <laughs> we hit the wall at number four, actually. So we, we, got, we got to number four. Um, so, hey, so uh, thanks again for coming tonight. I appreciate it. I know it's, you, uh, you, you probably work today, and uh, it's a long day, so I know evening meetups are a little tough. But I want to I um, spend the next 30 to 35 minutes, uh, maybe 40 minutes, talking um, a little bit about uh, Lean UX, as you would expect, um, but really the, the, a lot of the things that I've learned over the last uh, four or five years of uh, thinking about the stuff, practicing the stuff, writing about it, teaching, working with companies, starting a consulting business around it, and, and really kind of take you through a little bit of, of a walk through kind of where things started and why they started a certain way and how they've evolved and, and where, in my mind, things sit today when it comes to building uh, great products, uh, building great cross-functional product development teams, and, and, and ultimately spending our time as, as makers of products and services, developing things that people actually care about, that people actually want to use. Uh, there's so many instances, instances I know in my past where I've worked on things that I didn't care about, that I knew no one cared about, that we didn't want to use, and I'm sure that's happened in your career as well. And I think that a lot of the material that, that we talk about in the context of lean, lean startup, agile, lean UX, all of these uh, methodologies, processes, and philosophies that ultimately focus on making sure that the things that we're working on matter to the people that we're building them for, that they actually make a difference in the way that they um, interact with each other, do their jobs, uh, you know, share, uh, that type of thing. And so, uh, you know, buy stuff, whatever it is. So, so that's really what I want to uh, ultimately uh, focus on this. So let's get started. So uh, four years ago, I, uh, four and a half years ago at this point, I published an article on Smashing Magazine called Lean UX, Getting Out of the Deliverables Business. That article came out in March of 2011. And that really was the, the kind of the, the, the initial uh, push to the community, to the, uh, to the design community, some of the ideas behind Lean UX and, and thinking about user experience design in a lean context. Now, the, the, the impetus for writing this article and for sharing this content was that back then and kind of leading up to that, that period of time in my life, I was working in situations that were becoming increasingly agile. And my team and I were being asked to do design, good design, in these agile situations. And any, any, you know, five years ago and, and, old and, and, and kind of earlier than that, if you were to run a, a Google search for agile and UX, you end up with stories of heartbreak, right? Stories of tragedy, right? Stories of nightmares, you know, a trail of tears, right? This sucks, agile and UX have no business being together. Uh, it'll never work. It's never meant to be this way. Uh, this is, you know, there's no way we can do good design this way. And that was uh, certainly the position that I found myself in at the time. I was, I'd started a job in New York at a company called The Ladders, which had a UK presence for a while as well. Uh, it was a job board. In, in, in New York, uh, in the US, it was a job board that placed people who made $100,000 or, or more. That was the connection that was going on there. Uh, when I joined the company, in October 2008, they were in the midst of an engineering-driven transformation to become more agile. And my job was to build a design practice in that world. Now, initially, it was a very spec-driven company. You know, big, thick design specs, annotated wireframes, the whole deal, and then that heavy negotiation process that happens with engineers when you finish that design spec document, right? So you're done, you give it to an engineer, and what do they say? No. Right. I'm not going to build it. And that's the, that's the world that I came from. That was, that was very familiar to me, and that was the world I stepped into when I started at the ladders. But then this agile thing caught 
you know, caught steam, and we had to figure out how to build a design practice. And we tried a lot of different things. We tried to take the whole waterfall design phase approach that we sometimes got a month, maybe on a generous project we got two months for, and just collapse it into a two-week sprint. And that failed. And we tried multiple variations of bringing design into this rapid kind of scrum-based process. And, uh, and, and we failed a lot. And then we began to get some traction. And as we figured out a way to make design work well within this Agile uh, process, we began to write about it. And as we began to write, we began to practice, we got a lot of feedback from the community, and over time, this became kind of the, the, the foundation for Lean UX, the, the, the book, the article, and so forth, and starting to undo some of this stuff, some of this Agile UX heartbreak stuff that was, that was the norm for most teams and most projects, that I, that certainly people that I, that I reached out to and talked to. Now, there are two fundamental things that we learned as we began to find a rhythm for making design and Agile work well together. The first was that design had to change. The way that we were doing design, and I, and I use that term broadly to, to include visual design, interaction design, content, and so forth, had to change. You know, in, in the waterfall world, at least in my, in my experience, um, you know, we got a period of time to do design. Sometimes it was a month, like on a generous project, maybe it was six weeks or eight weeks. Sometimes it was three days, right? Who knows, right? But, but the point is we still had that design phase. That was our time, right? And, and requirements went into the front of that process and design happened in the process. And then, you know, specs came out of the other end. Ultimately, that then we had to negotiate what actually got built. Right? And half the time, you know, on a good project, about half of that spec got actually implemented. That means half of the work that we were doing was waste and just getting thrown out the window. There had to be a different way of doing design. That was the first thing that we realized. Now, what was interesting was as we began to change the way that design worked, and I'm going to get into the details of it in a second, is that product development, the process itself, had to change, right? the way we made the sausage had to change. We could, you couldn't just change one piece of the process and hope that everything else was going to be okay. There had to be a different way of putting in this new way of designing with a new way of engineering, with a new way of product management and, and product definition and so forth. We had to change the top-down feature-driven approach to this new way and we had to define new roles and new practices and new responsibilities for designers and engineers, product managers, clients, content creators, and so let's, you know, I want, I want to unpack that a little bit, but we had to really think about both design changing and product development changing. First and foremost, for design to change, we had to move away from archives. Right? Again, the, 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 the normal output of the design phase was a design spec document. Right? And, we, and, and when half of that is getting implemented on a good day, there's half of it that's getting thrown away. We had to start focusing on transient artifacts, on creating a shared understanding and creating a communication channel with the people that we are trying to convince and influence, engineers, product managers, stakeholders, with as little work as we could do to have that communication take place. Right? If I could create something like this, and I did create this thing right here, right? and this got my point across to an engineer or to a stakeholder or to a product manager, why do I need to create anything else? Right? If this takes our conversation one step forward. Right? If I spent a, a week behind my monitor and came up with a wireframe de deck that explained this very same thing and then we decided not to do it, that's a week's wasted work of my time. Right? How do we leverage a conversation around transient artifacts? Right? Only doing as much work as we need to do to move the conversation forward the next little step forward. Right? Small batches, right? that's an agile philosophy. Right? What's the most important thing I need to communicate to the next person? And what's the least amount of work that I need to do to communicate that? And in most cases, it's something like this. It's a whiteboard conversation. It's, it's a sketch. Maybe it's a lightweight wireframe. Right? But let's get that conversation going. That was a big transition for us right? because we came from that very formal structure. The next thing is how do we get feedback faster from our colleagues? 
And how do we get comfortable starting to show more of that unfinished work, right? That sketch is unfinished work. And again, it's moving away from this interrogation process that certainly design reviews were in my world to a much more informal and more frequent conversations, right? One of the very popular sayings in the lean UX and the lean community is, uh, is uh, less stuff more often. So do less more often. Right? We're still going to do the same things, we're just not going to do them to the same extent, and we're going to do them more frequently. Let's have lighter meetings, let's have them more frequently, let's have these conversations. I used to work at a company called AOL, you may remember it. I may have sent you a CD at one point or another. Sorry. Um, when we did design at AOL, and we went into the, 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 the thing I dreaded the most when I worked at that company was the design review meeting because it was an interrogation. 25 VPs in the room, right, a very expensive meeting. You're up there defending why you made the button red and put it on the right side. Right? And every one of those VPs has to justify their presence in that meeting, so they have to say something. Right? But that was life. That's, that's how we worked. And so how do we move away from that with transient artifacts to move the conversation forward in an informal setting that happens more regularly? so that it's a continuous conversation, not this big monumental scary event that happens every now and again. So we had to change that, and that helped us move forward and bridge the agile and design gap a bit more than in, in a lean way. This was a huge break, breakthrough for us. Huge, because no one ever asked this question. All people cared about was shipping. Just get it out the door. Preferably on time and on budget, but regardless, get it out the door. But nobody was asking, so what? Our incentive was to ship features. When you ship features, you create bloated product. When you pause for a second to ask, why are we shipping this? What difference will it make in the end user's life, work experience, right? So what? So we shipped it, right? It changes the conversation. Shipping the product becomes the first step in that conversation. How do we get there faster? Because we don't know if it's actually going to make a difference in the customer's life. We had to change the question from did you ship it to so what? Right? What, what change did it make in the world, in the customer's experience, and move that forward? And that ultimately has to affect incentive structures, right? Because if your team's incentive structure is to ship features, that's what you're going to do. If your team's incentive structure is to improve the efficiency with which a customer completes a task, that changes the conversation. We have to figure out if, that actually, if the feature actually did that. How do we do that faster so that we don't build things that don't do that? Right? It automatically shifts the conversation when you start to think about user outcomes, right? measurable changes in customer behavior. And what this was reflecting was the pace of learning that was becoming much more uh, available to us. In the last five years, the DevOps movement has fundamentally redefined what it means to deploy software. And the pace of learning that we can gain from that movement is tremendous. To put a fine point on it, and, and I know Amazon's been in the news a lot this week, um, but I talk about them a lot, and I didn't want to take them out of my, my slides. Um, but to put a fine point on it, Amazon pushes code to production every 11.6 seconds. I'm gonna drink water while you think about that for a second. <laughs> Five times a minute. Some Amazon customer somewhere experiences a change in the service. And then they, they sense the change in customer behavior and then they respond to that change. Did it positively impact customer behavior? Terrific, let's do more of that and optimize it. Right? Did it not change customer behavior? Uh, positively, cool, let's roll it back, let's figure out why, and then let's do it again. And that changes everything. The pace of learning, first of all, becomes continuous. When I worked at AOL, the pace of learning was roughly 12 months. It took us about six months to create a new CD. We'd ship it, we'd collect feedback for about six months, we'd develop, and we'd get a new CD out. Right? It's about a 12-month feedback loop. The feedback loop today is 11.6 seconds in some cases, right? in an extreme case. Right? The faster you can get ideas into market, 
the faster you can respond to them. The faster you can have conversations with your colleagues, the faster you can decide how to react to this new continuous pace of learning. We don't have time to sit around for 12 months to decide what to ship next. We don't have time to sit around and create these heavy specification documents to then decide which part of that we're going to implement. We've got to move faster to reflect the pace of learning that's currently available to us. And so we have to rethink how we approach product development. This was a, a, another big breakthrough for us as we decided to figure out, as we started to figure out uh, not only process-wise how to change the way that we build products, but philosophically how to think about products. And the main point that we had to, to take to heart was we had to start approaching things from a position of humility, which is a lean philosophy. A position of humility an organizational point of view that says, is an organizational point of view that says, we don't know what the end state is going to be. And that's not how we typically uh, hire and ask our managers to do their jobs, right? It's their jobs to tell us what to build. They know the answer to this. In reality, they don't. They're taking guesses. And if we can appreciate that and assimilate that into our culture, then we take a position of humility that says our best guess, our ideas are at best guesses, they're assumptions. And we need to have a conversation about them as quickly as possible. We need to get ideas into market as quickly as possible and get feedback as quickly as possible to know how true those assumptions are or how false they are and then decide what to do about them. And that's really where great team collaboration starts to shine because you start to have that, uh, that sense of, well, we don't know the answer. And everybody's opinion could be equally valid. Let's get some ideas out talk to customers, get feedback, and build it in there. Let me prove my point to you. How many of you are runners? Hold your hand up. Okay, good, good chunk of the room. Keep your hand up for a second. Okay, uh, the runners. Okay, let me ask you a question. Okay, you can, you can, if, if, even if you run a little bit, you can hold your hand up. Okay, now, the, for the, <laughs> a few more hands are up. Good. Uh, how many of you, while you're out running, pause your your run, take out your phone, take some photos of what you see around you, upload them to social media, and then continue on with your run. Keep your hands up. Okay. Hmm? Don't upload them. Okay, upload them. Okay, so it's three, three out of about 40. Okay, why? Why don't we do that? Right? Because it's stupid. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> You're out there exercising, right? You're, not, you're, you're out there to get, to, uh, you know, you're not on a photography nature walk, right? Now look, what we just did there was a very common way for thinking about how to decide whether to or not to build a specific feature. It's a survey, it's a marketing tool. We talked to our customers and they said they wouldn't take photos while they were running because it's stupid, so we're not gonna build that feature, right? That's an assumption that we take as gospel because somebody in product, uh, man, product marketing, product management, executive leadership said, we did a survey and it said don't build that feature. Okay? But guess what? It turns out that when you run, you run past interesting things sometimes. The future is unpredictable. How customers will, what customers will come across as they're using your product is unpredictable. You run past scenery. And in fact, this is scenery that I ran past on one of my runs uh, in Los Angeles last summer. I was in Los Angeles and I was in uh, Venice Beach, which is beautiful. It's got palm trees and a, and a boardwalk and a Venice Pier. It goes out into the ocean about a kilometer or so. And I was running uh, out there and, and you get out to the end of Venice Pier and uh, I, was using, I was using an app called Map My Run. You guys know that app, Map My Run? For those of you who don't know it, it uh, maps your run. <laughs> That's a good name for a product, right? And so I'm using this app and it's tracking my run and I get out to the end of Venice Pier and you run out of land. You're kind of you're a kilometer into the ocean and uh, you know, the, the birds are chirping and the surfers are out and the sun is rising. I live in New Jersey, we don't have palm trees, right? Palm trees are swaying. Uh, that type of thing, and, and uh, I, uh, I, you know, you, I kind of ran out of land, and so I decided to pause the tracking of my run right at that moment. And this is the screen that came up. It said, do you want to take the, a photo and add it to your run? Right there, when I, pa I just paused it. I didn't stop tracking, I just paused it. 
and it said no thanks or go MVP, which I thought was cool. It didn't mean minimum viable product. I think it meant just a sports thing, so it's probably most valuable player or something like that. But, uh, but it said no thanks or, or go MVP. And look, uh, this, was my, this is the scene. Right? This was the view that I was, I was actually looking at right when I saw that screen on my phone. And I said, hell yeah, I want to take that photo. Go MVP. And they said, terrific. Give us $30. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I said, no thanks. Now look, this is a tremendous opportunity to learn continuous learning, right? Survey goes up, nobody would do this. But ask in the context of use, all of a sudden this becomes a viable feature because people do run past interesting things and take photos. And it might make sense to capture that while they're running. And you can test that by putting the smallest thing out into the market that you can. In this case, it was a modal overlay and a pricing screen. You can test intent, you can test interest, you can test price point, right? And you don't have to build any of this stuff until you get enough taps on the button that says, go MVP, and yes, I will give you $30 for this, or $12, or $50, or whatever the price point is that you're testing, right? This is a transient artifact. It's a small amount of work to get an idea out into market quickly, to get some feedback, and then to make a much more accurate decision based on evidence. And what this teaches us is that we have to change the way that we define products. We can't define products like this, this anymore. This is a conversation that took place in our Slack uh, room in New York City about six months ago uh, for Neo. Now, what, what's happening in this, and it's a lot of stuff to read, is that we were trying to read an article in the Wall Street Journal and somebody went and hit the paywall. And they said, oh, you don't have to do that. You can just uh, enter the article. You can, you can either run a script against it, or you can just enter the article headline into Google and hit search, and then you can see the whole article. Because they want to be found on Google, but they also want to charge you money for, for the content. Right? Now, somebody thought that was a good customer experience. Right? They didn't run any experiments. They didn't test it. They didn't validate it. They, they didn't try out that user experience. And it ends up with this ridiculous kind of hack that everybody knows about and can get around if they wanted to, right? What we have to start thinking about is new ways to let our products evolve, right? This is the Twitter home screen when it first launch, launched, right? There's for, uh, one of the many things that's not mentioned on here, for example, it's the hashtag, right? The hashtag evolved. It was something that came out of the community to help track conversations. It wasn't something that anybody could predict. Twitter put an idea into the market, People used it, and then they figured out ways to hack around its insufficient uh, feature set. And then they adopted the things that the community built into the product itself, where the hashtag has become uh, certainly a part of the lexicon and certainly a part of the Twitter experience. Right? It's, we have to look at, uh, at, at our assumptions. We have to test them. And then we have to let the products evolve, let, let the customer usage determine how we move forward how to help people improve the way that they interact with our products. Now, there's one more thing that we have to watch out for, and I, I, and I know Mr. Bezos has been in the news a lot lately, um, is just because we've been right in the past with our assumptions doesn't mean we'll be right in the future. Again, this is a very, very difficult thing to accept. This is uh, uh, Jeff Bezos announcing the Amazon Fire Phone. Please hold up your Amazon Fire Phones. Exactly, right? Um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos has been right for the last 20 years on many of his assumptions. Right? He's built a tremendous retail business. He's built a tremendous cloud business. Uh, he's building a drone business, right? And then he decided he wanted to build a phone that competed with the iPhone. And when this launched, after three years of development and several teams that he fired that couldn't give him the features that he wanted, right, it launched at $199. That's what an iPhone costs. And the expectation was that this would compete at the same level, that Amazon's brand competed at the same level of the aspirational brand of Apple, right? Whereas people see Amazon as a utility versus Apple as an aspiration, but that didn't, that didn't click over here. And when they talked to the people 
who built, worked on this project. There's a terrific article in Fast Company about what went wrong with this particular project. When they talk to the people who did this, they said, why did you build this feature? Why did you work on this phone? Why did you do this thing? And they said, because Jeff told us to. Because Jeff wanted it. Now, aside from the fact that they worked for the man, right, and he kind of held their job in their hands, but aside from that, look at how right he had been for the last 20 years. Right? It makes sense for these folks to assume that he'd be right again. Except he wasn't, and they took a $170 million bath on the fire phone. Right? So just because your assumptions have been right in the past doesn't mean they'll be right in the future. If you accept that position of humility, then you're always kind of, there's that burning sense of skepticism in everything that you're doing, and that's good. Get out there, get something out of the market quickly, and figure out if it's the right thing to do. And that's what we do with experimentation, which is something that we took to heart as we began to refine this lean process, this uh, design process, in, uh, in an agile world. Let's experiment, let's get a prototype out there quickly. Let's get some customers using it on a regular basis. Let's get some feedback and then let's refine it. And what happens is, is that the fidelity of your experiment goes up as the amount of truth in your assumptions goes up. So if your initial set of assumptions is based on a lot of unknown, the fidelity of your experiment should be pretty low. And as you start to get real facts from your experiments, from your prototyping, from your customer conversations, the fidelity of your experiments goes up. Paper prototype, clickable prototype, live data prototype, right? feature sets, A-B tests, full deployment, that type of thing. And that's when we start to think about this concept of minimal viable product. I really love this diagram. I, I know you guys have probably seen this. It made, it made the rounds for a long time. Um, I love this diagram because it really gives a sense of what these experiments should be, minimally viable experiments Right? It's, it's a slice that gives you a sense of what the future could look like. And the definition that I like to use is this one. Okay? What's the smallest thing that we can make or do to test our assumptions? That's your experiment. That's your minimum viable product. That's your MVP. Right? And it could be as simple as that index card could be a clickable prototype. You may have to push a feature live, right? You have to determine what you need to learn next. And as you get that feedback, you'll fail. And then you iterate. You'll get it wrong the first time. This is wrong. OK? It's, it's wrong. <laughs> and then you try again. And every time you take that step, you take a more accurate step in the right direction. We iterate that forward. And along the way, you're collecting data, right? Not that data. This data, right? Quantitative data, right? How many people clicked on it? Where did they click? Where did they drop off? What did they do? Right? And as the fidelity of our experiments increased, we, start, we can collect this quantitative data. Now, along with that, we want to collect the qualitative data as well. Because if you're only collecting quantitative data, you're only getting a sense of what's happening, but you don't know why. So coming up with the next iteration is a stab in the dark. People didn't click the button. Why? Right? Let's talk to them and figure it out. Right? Otherwise, the solutions that you come up to figure out to get people to click the button don't necessarily solve for what the real problem is. And as you build this culture of continuous learning, of humility, of experimentation, of iteration, you build responsiveness into your organization. Right? This is your ability, your team's ability to react quickly to newly learned information. Right? It's not enough to, to simply acknowledge that our, our products don't meet our customers' needs. We now have to respond to it. Right? And we have to let our teams you know, one of the biggest learnings that we had is that we had to cut out the bureaucracy. We had to let our teams be, be empowered to respond to the insight as it came in without having to run every decision up a bureaucratic ladder and back down before we could make the next iteration. And that's what builds organizational agility and responsiveness, right? If we're responsive, in other words, if we're agile, we can take everything that comes at us, right? Every learning, every curve in the road, we stay calm and collected, right? We're this guy, <laughs> right? That's who we want to be in any situation, right? No matter what's happening around us, 
We want to be that guy. That's what organizational agility gives us. Right? Because we all, we're always in a situation where we're calm and collected and we can respond quickly. We're comfortable with that as an organization. We're comfortable with continuous change. And if we do that, then we start to change our measure of success. Our measure of success doesn't become, did you ship it? It's, did we change customer behavior? Success becomes outcomes, not features. Do you guys know what this is? This photo is? Right, this is how, uh, this is, I, I forget which country this is in, but this is um, how they queue at the, at the DMV or the post office. They just put their shoes. They don't want to stand in line for a long time. They just put their shoes in line. Right? Can we improve customer behavior? We can measure that. In a digital world, you can measure customer behavior. That's our definition of success. And here's the most interesting thing. Like, we'll take this up one more. So we start off with, with uh, transient artifacts, deliverables, right? And we started to talk about uh, rapid learning, iteration, and experimentation, right? And now we're talking about our new measure of success, which is outcomes, right? When we take it up one more level to measuring progress and funding. All of a sudden, the way that we measure progress in our projects changes. No longer are we reporting to a roadmap of features necessarily, but we are reporting towards a metric. Right? Task completion rate, time on task, uh, number of uh, you know, requests for help, whatever it is. And because we have that information about how well a project is changing customer behavior, we can make an evidence-based decision about funding. Hey, this team's been working on this for a quarter. Should we fund them for another quarter? Should we fund them for an another quarter after that? We have the evidence to do it. Not, well, they were the iPhone app team last year, so well, we need to have an iPhone app team this year, so let's fund them again for this year. Right? Can we change customer behavior? Helps us determine if we're making progress towards the right goals and what we should actually be investing in as a company, all of that. And all this stuff changes everything. It changes the way that we work together in design, in engineering, in product management. Two scenarios to look at. First of all, the agency. If you work in a services environment, and that's the environment that I work in, you have to start adopting a new business model. Agencies traditionally are in the deliverables business. They sell documentation, they sell wireframes, they sell prototypes, they sell code, they sell features. Right? We're no longer selling specs and prototypes. And we're no longer selling fixed deadlines and fixed scope. Right? I don't know about your experience, but in my experience, every single time I've worked on a project that had fixed time and fixed scope, one of three things has happened. You know those three things? Right? You move the deadline, you reduce scope, or you go into crunch mode for the last three weeks of the project, 80-hour weeks until you get it done, then everybody quits and goes to work somewhere else. <laughs> right? We're no longer selling single services like design or UX or content. We're selling whole teams. We're selling time of those teams, and we're selling outcomes. And what this sells is risk mitigation. When a client comes to you at the beginning and says, hey, I'd like you to build these 10 features, how long will it take? And you say three months, that is a lie. Right? Because how do we know that it's done? Right? The definition of done is not shipping it. It's changing customer behavior, and that's key. Now, if you work in-house, this also changes everything. First of all, you cannot work as an internal agency anymore. We have to build cross-functional teams. Design is a component of every product team. Engineering is a component of every product team. Product management, product ownership, content, so forth. Right? Transparency is key. What are we doing? What are they doing? Can we learn from them? Learning is key. Being wrong needs to be OK. It has to be a safe place to say, we tried it. It didn't work. Not only, not only am I not going to get fired, I'm going to get another shot to get it right. And again, the tasking of these teams need to change from, uh, customer, uh, from shipping features to changing customer behaviors. And sometimes that comes down to simply changing a team's name. Think about it for a second. If you work on the iPhone app team, right? that's the name of your team, the iPhone app team, what is the mission of that team? To ship the app, right? To ship the app. If we simply change the name of that team to the mobile commerce team, what happens to the mission of that team? Right? Maybe they ship an app. Maybe they ship a responsive website. Maybe they work geotagging. 
into the product, right? Beacons, whatever, right? It changes the scope of what they're doing and the measure of success. And that fundamentally changes how we work together as an in-house team. All of this is in the service of getting out of the deliverables business, of making specs, of making diagrams, of having lengthy debates and conversations, and it's about getting to some version of the product faster. Some idea into market quickly, to get some feedback, and to build it and move it forward. Right? Minimal wireframes, only what you need to get the conversation forward, prototypes, focusing on outcomes, not features, and ultimately, attempting to change customer behavior. And that's what I've learned in the last four years of working this way. Thanks for listening. <laughs>